Hey there, all you musical theater maniacs. Welcome to Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Benani, and this week I thought I'd start a brand new series called Broadway Scandals. Oh, that sounds very exciting. Who doesn't love a good scandal or some juicy gossip, am I right? And Broadway is a bevy of scandals and unsavory characters to explore. Musical theater people are respected, refined, cultured. No, they're, they're bros, Sharon. So, to start off this new series, I thought we'd look at a scintillating scandal that rocked not only the theater world, but the entire country in the mid-1920s. The date, February 22nd, 1926. The place, the Earl Carroll Theater in New York City. It was a Monday night when most Broadway theaters were dark, but on this fateful night, the theater and all of its swanky inhabitants were lit. What would transpire would be a bacchanalia of debauchery so shocking it would land one of Broadway's biggest impresarios in the slammer. It's the scandal of Earl Carroll and his boozy bathtub beauty. Earl Carroll is a major figure in the history of musical theater, especially when it comes to the reviews in the 1920s. Carroll was a librettist, a lyricist, a composer, a producer, a director, a theater owner. Carroll was also one of Florence Ziegfeld and his famous Follies biggest competitors with his Earl Carroll's Vanities and Earl Carroll's Sketchbook Reviews, which had 12 editions between them from 1923 to 1940. Carol's nickname was the Troubadour of the Nude. All right, you got me. That's an awesome nickname. And he certainly earned this moniker. All of his shows featured dozens of beautiful Corrines, as scantily clad as law would allow, and then some. So when Earl Carroll threw a lavish birthday party for one of his biggest backers at his eponymously named Earl Carroll Theater on 50th Street and 7th Avenue, his guests knew exactly what kind of good, very dirty fun lay in store. It is a tableau of unfathomable depravity. Come on in! The party reportedly didn't start until midnight. Guests of honor included birthday boy backer William Edrington, as well as Harry K. Thaw, who any ragtime fan will remember, was married to Evelyn Nesbitt and famously murdered her former lover Stanford White in 1906 during a performance of a show on the rooftop garden of Madison Square Garden. In all, there were said to be between 300 and 500 guests at this party. As they entered through the stage door of the theater, which famously had the words, through these portals past the most beautiful girls in the world, Carol himself was there to greet his guests and have them sign phony contracts swearing them to secrecy and uh, promising not to reveal the outrageous exploits they were going to indulge in that evening. Party tonight, but don't tell anyone! On stage, there were tables and tables of food, as well as a large iron claw-footed bathtub filled to the brim with liquor. Remember, this was 1926, and prohibition was very much still in effect, though very loosely regulated, especially in New York City. Prohibition. They tried that in the movies and it didn't work. And all of this was below a massive framed picture of George Washington, our first president, whose birthday it also happened to be. And this joint birthday party for backer William Edrington, as well as our founding father, George Washington, was a doozy. Oh, and oh, what a doozy of a doozy it was! It's just some of the goings on reportedly included a Charleston contest, a bathing suit contest, there was two orchestras, a hot dog stand, and all of the Vanities girls from the latest edition handing out hors d'oeuvres in lingerie. That would have to be like the best party ever. The big finale, however, came at about 4 a.m. Earl Carroll asked all of his guests to sit in the orchestra section of the theater, and that bathtub, the Iron Club, uh, Iron Club bathtub, was wheeled center stage and refilled with champagne, though some would later claim it was actually red wine. But let's go with champagne. Champagne! Champagne for all! Carol asked one of his female guests for a cloak, and then a young model, Joyce Hawley, walked on stage in an orange chemise and slippers and stood on a chair in front of the tub. Then on cue, Earl Carroll opened the cloak, blocking the audience's view. The chemise was seen hitting the floor, and she stepped into the tub. 
Cute. No, that sounds a bit racy. Now, of course, Earl Carroll made sure and whipped away the cloak early so the guests had a full view of Miss Holly lowering herself into the tub. Men are disgusting. Yeah. Carol then said, line forms to the right, and guests lined up at the tub and dipped their glasses into the liquid. They were having a wild, wild party. They were having a wild, wild party. And as crazy as this night was, it probably would have just lived on in the memories of the guests and died with them along with all the other memories of hedonistic parties Broadway's upper crust threw in the roaring 20s. After all, discretion was the code of the day and they took it pretty seriously. You tell anyone I'll slit your throat. <laughs> In attendance at this party were all the major press at the time, including the titan of tabloids himself, Walter Winchell. They were all there as invited guests. Earl Carroll always believed in keeping the press happy. He believed they would get a story if they wanted it hard enough, whether he allowed them to or not. Might as well keep him happy and on his team. That makes a lot of sense. And no one would dare break that trust and publish a story about the scandalous shindig. And as I mentioned before, Carroll made sure and uh, had people sign those phony NDAs to really bring home the point that mum was the word. Mum. 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 So how did this story get out? Well, Philip Payne, the editor of the Daily Mirror, a popular New York uh, tabloid newspaper at the time, arrived late. He arrived around 2 a.m. And by that point, the host was too busy leading the revelry to have him do the same. Oops. And apparently, discretion be damned, this was just too good a story. The next morning, the headline, Nude Girl Stars at Orgy. Model takes bath in wine, celebrities drink tub dry, blazed across the front page of the Daily Mirror. We, 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 don't, we don't have a picture? All the other major papers picked up the story, and it was a full-blown scandal. It's a scandal! It's an outrage! Pulpits around the country held up the headlines from this story as examples of the devil's work incarnate, which of course only made the titillating tale more enticing. It was all anyone could talk about, though unfortunately for Earl Carroll, that also included the federal government. <laughs> Carol was loving all the publicity and gave several statements flat out denying that there was any booze served at his party, certainly not in a bathtub with a female garnish. The government, trying desperately to maintain its feeble enforcement of prohibition laws, couldn't ignore the story and brought Carol in before a grand jury. And again, he completely denied everything. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! He stated that at no point in the evening did anyone step in, fall in, or was pushed in a bathtub, and the only liquid served at his party was Canada Dry Ginger Ale. Philip Payne, the girl in the tub herself, Joyce Holly, and several others testified to the contrary. And Carol was indicted. Though not for the alcohol, it wasn't illegal to serve free alcohol at private parties. I did not know that. <laughs> he was indicted for perjury. You sit on a throne of lies. The trial commenced in May of 1926 and was a media circus. Several high-profile celebrities testified in defense of Earl Carroll, including the biggest celebrity at the time, Al Jolson. Hilariously, I think, Earl Carroll's lawyers also tried to argue that since Prohibition had been around for about six years at that point, that uh, Miss Holly and some of the men who had testified that champagne had been served were too young to have known what champagne tastes or smells like. Yeah, sure. But nobody really bought that, nor believed there wasn't alcohol at this party or Miss Holly didn't get in the tub. Carol's own lawyer even admitted in his closing arguments that his client may have told some untruths to protect his guests' anonymity, but if he lied, he lied like a gentleman. Yeah, uh, no, it doesn't really work that way. The trial only lasted four days and the jury came back after only 65 minutes of deliberation with a guilty verdict. Guilty. Earl Carroll was sentenced to a year and a day in federal penitentiary and was fined $2,000. Many have wondered over the years why Carroll would have stuck to his story of denying everything so strongly, especially you would figure his high-priced lawyers would know that they weren't able to convict him on the alcohol charges alone. Well, that is strange. Some speculate it was at the behest of Mayor Jimmy Walker who was in attendance at the party that night. Others think that it was because if he were to admit that there was alcohol at the party, he might be asked under oath to supply the name of his bootlegger. And uh, Carol certainly wouldn't want to do that as I'm sure his bootlegger was somebody 
in the mob, and you do not want to make an enemy of the Cosa Nostra, that is for sure. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. Another given reason for him sticking to his guns was just pure unbridled ego. Once he said something, his ego would not let him admit to any mistakes, and he had to stick to that story. Can you imagine someone so infantile to lie about silly little things over and over again just because of their ego? Believe me. 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 Carol was paroled after nine months, and afterwards he went straight back to Broadway to produce his raciest edition of The Vanities yet. Of course he did. And that is the scandal of Earl Carroll and his boozy bathtub beauty. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, it would be really great if you could give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel if you haven't. It would really help me to grow this channel and keep making these videos. Uh, and go ahead and share this video with the person you'd like to try a sip of. Yeah. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Mark Benani. This is Broadway by Ghostlight. I'll see y'all next time.